This is Free to Exchange, the show where free markets and free thinking scholars meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. Today we're delving into history to discuss the economics of slavery in the American South during the Civil War. First, we'll discuss the role of slavery in the American economy prior to the Civil War and how important, or not, slavery was to the subsequent development of the United States. Then, with my second guest, we'll discuss how the Confederacy managed and mismanaged their economy during the war. My first guest is Dr. Jeffrey Hummel. Dr. Hummel is a professor of economics at San Jose State University. He's also author of the book, Emancipating Slaves, Enslaving Free Men, A History of the Civil War. Jeff, welcome back to the show. It's my pleasure. So I want to have you here today to talk about uh, the economics of slavery in the early 19th century in the United States. And specifically the reason is because there's been a, a whole series for going on a year in the New York Times called 1619, and, or the 1619 Project. Right. And it's recognizing the, the 400 years ago slavery was brought to the United States. And in doing it, it's bringing up what they're calling the, the new history of capitalism. Right. So I think to start with, would you say that the United States at time of its founding through mid 19th century is essentially a capitalist country? Uh, yes, pretty much, yep. So would also, I think as classical liberals say, you know, a nation that was conceived in liberty, clearly the, the, the missing part of that was for close to a third of the people lacked the liberty that was given to everybody else. And in a, I would say a true capitalist system based on freedom and free enterprise, everybody would have equal liberty. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, a third of the people in the slave states. <laughs> right. So what the new historians of capitalism or, or the new history of capitalism is pointing out, they say that, you know, you had this capitalist system, but simultaneously this aberration, this slavery. And what are the claims that they're making about the relation between the two? Well, first of all, they're, um, they don't consider slavery an aberration. They consider slavery the foundation of capitalism. So maybe that's worth a moment right there. Why do we consider or why do... Why do you consider it an aberration? Well, because um, free market capitalist uh, economies are based on free labor, not on slave labor. And, and so it's, a, it's a, a contradiction. And also, obviously, the existence of slavery uh, contradicts the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. So, uh, and the, the founders, many of the founders, even some who were slaveholders, recognized that uh, contradiction. So is the kind of claim within them that, that they're, well, maybe not from them, but I guess you're, I could imagine an argument where they say, uh, or someone says, I see this contradiction, but capitalism is a system based on private property. They did not recognize the liberty of, of these people, so they essentially became private property that's part of the capitalist system. Is, how does that relate to the, the claims being made? Well, yeah, they, first of all, because slaveholders defended slavery as a form of private property, um, there is that ambiguity there that uh, people who want to identify capitalism and private property with slavery can exploit. Uh, <clears throat> but basically, um, what part of the country developed first? It was the North. The, the part that uh, had free labor, not the, not, not the uh, slave states. So what then is the claim of the, the, the new history of capitalism on the relationship between slavery and the success of capitalism? Because I think everybody recognized the North developed faster. So what do they say? Well, their argument is that, first of all, um, you couldn't have that, that slavery was a necessary condition for the widespread production of cotton or slavery or some other form of unfree labor, and that cotton production was a necessary condition for setting off the Industrial Revolution because cotton textiles was one of the leading sectors in the early period of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, all of that does, uh, I don't know about the, the, the necessary part. <laughs> right, well that's the Getting that's out of the, the words of, necessary, this doesn't seem implausible to me. What, what's wrong with it? Well, um, there's a difference between necessary and, 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 well, they go beyond necessary, essential. And so um, the, the question is, um, how essential was slavery to the production of uh, cotton? So actually, let's just get a, a I mean, in terms of, the uh, U.S. economy in early 1800s, how big 
was cotton, or actually for that matter, everything associated with slavery as kind of a percent of our overall economy. Well, cotton production um, in the uh, pre-Civil War period accounted for about 5% of GDP. It was the major U.S. export. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, 50% of uh, exports uh, were cotton, but it wasn't even the major, uh, in terms of value, the major agricultural product, uh, which was corn. More corn was produced in the U.S. than um, cotton. So it's, there's no denying that cotton was important, and there's no denying that slavery was involved with the production of cotton, but the weak links in the argument are, first of all, um, was it absolutely essential? And the insight of economists is that just because something um, <clears throat> um, plays a role uh, you know, in, in economic growth, it doesn't mean that it's essential. And, and, what, and what the new historians of capitalism have ignored is the economic principle of thinking on the margin. How important was slavery? How important was cotton? And when you get into the actual numbers, you discover that it made a difference, but it didn't make an essential difference. It wasn't absolutely necessary. And the obvious um, uh, uh, um, counterpoint is that um, uh, there were periods when cotton in the US um, was not go flowing into um, Great Britain and the textile mills um, during the War of 1812, during Jefferson's embargo, and then obviously during the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, right, cotton production recovers, <laughs> and uh, within a decade, it's, it's uh, um, at and exceeding the level of output um, prior to the Civil War, and a lot of white farmers have moved from um, different kinds of farming into cotton production. So, so actually then, let's pause just there for a second and think about, you've identified three episodes where cotton exports from the United States, which was big for the exports to Great Britain, uh, virtually disappear. Right. And then a trough after the Civil War of production that quickly recovers after, what's going on in industry in the North, industrialization, the, the thing we usually associate with capitalism, and in Great Britain during these periods? Do we see industrial, major industrial slowdowns, or do we continue to see capital accumulation and increasing generalized levels of prosperity? In general, you see um, sustained economic growth. Um, output is increasing. Now, the Civil War uh, uh, did uh, impose a hit on the textile industry in Great Britain, but very quickly, um, uh, Britain began exploiting other uh, sources of cotton. Other slave sources of cotton? No, other. Um, some of them were colonial sources of, of, of cotton, so you could say that there was, uh, it wasn't pure free labor, but it, was, it, it didn't involve chattel slavery of the type that existed in the United States. You know, actually, let's explore this international dimension a little bit more, because also when we think, I mean, the history of slavery in the world is widespread throughout mm -hmm. both the uh, geographic expanse and through time. Uh, but yet, industrial revolution is relatively narrow focused at a time when slavery was on the retreat and relatively limited. What other evidence in terms of timing of industrialization in other countries and slavery would you like to mention on this? Well, um, first of all, um, the industrial uh, cotton doesn't become important in the United States as an export until the turn of the uh, century, until 1800. And the Industrial Revolution has already started in Great Britain decades before that. So the notion that, uh, that uh, uh, the takeoff in Great Britain was uh, depended on U.S. cotton um, is just a non-starter. Now, cotton was coming from other parts uh, of the world, and particularly uh, the West Indies. But then uh, cotton is not a major part of the takeoff of France, uh, the takeoff of the Netherlands or Belgium um, uh, or uh, Denmark. Uh, so so it, it's really the new history of capitalism is sort of grossly overstating uh, their claims. Would it be wrong to, to say that just uh, discovery of freedom, free enterprise, capitalist institutions is occurring multiple places and it's what they trade happens to differ from place by place and it's mostly historical, yeah, well, historical accident that, that cotton was involved in? Yeah, that's in. Pre pretty obvious. I mean, what's going on is first of all, technological innovation and then um, 
widespread capital accumulation. And that's really, those are really the uh, defining characteristics uh, or, or the, um, the underlying causes of the beginning of sustained economic growth. And actually, now this goes back to some of the claims made by some of this new history of capitalism too, uh, the growth of output of cotton in the United States. How important was just the increasing coercion of labor, of working slaves, hard of How much of it was yeah, that kind of market-based uh, technological innovation? And yeah, well, you, you, you've hit upon a critical weakness in particularly one of the books uh, in the New History of Capitalism, which uh, attempts to argue, turns out that over the 60 years from 1800 to 1860, um, the amount of cotton per day per field hand uh, rose by a factor of four. And the authors who were economists who discovered that um, identified several factors that were responsible for it, particularly the introduction of new varieties of cotton, which were easier to pick, and um, also uh, the movement into the more fertile southwest part of the uh, uh, country. And yet the new history of capitalism wants to argue that, that you have this um, <clears throat> Uh, rat ratcheting up of torture, <laughs> uh, the, the author refers to this as the pushing system that's forcing slaves um, to uh, I increase the amount they pick every day. And they're not even arguing that it, it's a level effect. They're arguing it's a sustained effect over 60 years, right? The torture's increasing over 60 years. That's absurd on the face of it. I mean, that would make um, the Gulag Archipelago the most productive economic system in the world if torture was that effective at increasing output. And, and presumably they would have been doing this all along anyway. It's not a new technology. Right, and so. also, yeah, in fact, the general impression is that the treatment of slaves improved before this literature came out, that the treatment of slaves improved from the colonial period up until the uh, Civil War, uh, not that it got worse and worse and worse. So just our last uh, few seconds here. So it seems like maybe there's an irony in this, this literature too. Yeah, the irony is that uh, these authors who are extreme opponents of slavery are invoking the same argument that was made by the pro-slavery theorists prior to the Civil War. It was known as the King Cotton Hypothesis. And the argument was that uh, the North and the rest of the world is dependent on cotton and they can't do without us. And actually that belief contributed to the willingness of the South to risk secession. All very interesting. Thanks for joining me today, Jeff. Thank you. The Confederate government made a mess of their economy during the Civil War. Stick around to find out how when we come back. This program is made possible in part by a grant from the Helen Jones Foundation, supporting education and the fine arts in keeping with the philosophy of Helen DeWitt Jones, who devoted her later life to sharing her wealth as a patron of philanthropic causes. The Helen Jones Foundation. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. Welcome back. Joining me now is Dr. Brian Kutzinger. Dr. Kutzinger is an assistant professor of economics at Angelo State University and an assistant director and research professor at Texas Tech's Free Market Institute. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So a lot of people... Uh, love reading about the American Civil War. Uh, they tend to learn about you know, military history or the political history. A lot are less familiar with the economic history going on during the Civil War. And I'd like to talk about that with you today. Uh, specifically, maybe to start off, I mean, everybody I think knows that the North and South started off on very unequal footing. Uh, but just to, as a way of background to begin, what was the South's economic situation entering into the war. Sure. So at the beginning of the war, as you mentioned, the Union or the North had a fair amount of industrialization, their ability to produce, say, muskets and, and other types of things you would need for war making was vastly exceeded that of the South, uh, which really had no formal military arsenals or, or anything like that. So the Southern economy was primarily agrarian at the onset of the war, which meant that when the war started, there needed to be some way of getting those things and producing those things that the South would need if it wanted to fight an effective campaign. 
So how does it go? I mean, you can go about making it yourself or you can go about trading for it. What's the South strategy of how they start to go about this? So there's a little bit of both. So one way for the South to get what it needed would be to essentially buy it from Europe. So Europe could produce those things. The South could try to uh, to buy it from them. Uh, but in order to do that, the South would, would need gold uh, to do that because European countries are probably not going to be very willing to, uh, uh, to accept anything else for those types of goods. Uh, so... Because of that, and we'll get to this shortly, they had to, the southern government had to essentially take over the banking system of the South. But the other thing that they did was they essentially started creating a bunch of state owned enterprises. So they started, instead of relying on private enterprise, they actually created government run uh, companies to produce those things that the South needed to fight the war. So in the North, where you had the existing factories, the government presumably raised money through taxation and somewhat through the printing press and just paid for it from the factories. The South, they're going to do it themselves. That's correct. So what ends up happening in the North, they start off by relying on a little bit of printing money. That's where the term greenbacks came from. Uh, but primarily, they raise money through taxes and bonds. Uh, this and, and they use that money to then buy goods from uh, private companies. The so, South, sorry. So presumably, Southern entrepreneurs, though, would be willing to build these factories and do it. Why didn't the South just raise money through taxes and bonds and then pay private industry to make things for them. So there's a couple issues there. The first was that uh, the South had a very difficult time creating the infrastructure necessary to collect taxes. We somewhat take it for granted today that collecting taxes is just something that governments do. Uh, but back then, there was no large tax bureaucracy to collect tax revenue uh, from the South, which meant that the South really couldn't rely on taxes. They tried to issue bonds, but they had difficult finding, difficulty finding people that were willing to buy them, which meant that the South had to turn to the printing press to pay for a lot of uh, to pay for a lot of what they want. The other challenge that the South ran into is that they drafted so many of their uh, their citizens into the military to fight the war uh, that that you basically were taking entrepreneurs who otherwise could create companies and basically said that's too bad you're going to come fight in the army for us. So when they resort to then. Uh the direct national nationalization or founding of, of their own how do these companies operate uh, so essentially much like a bureaucracy operates so some person is put in charge of creating this bureaucracy uh, they're uh, uh, they, they go out they try to hire people to work for the bureaucracy uh, buy the the inputs necessary to, to build rifles or, or gunpowder or, or uh, process wool to turn it into uniforms and they're essentially run like a government agency so the way the Soviets did their military. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it was essentially forced industrialization uh, via state-owned enterprises. And meanwhile, then, what's going on? Because they still need revenue to do these things, to purchase the inputs to go into the factories. Still, So how are they raising revenue if they can't raise it through taxation and bond issue? So what they did was... They started taking. They essentially started taking over their banking system. So as I mentioned earlier, the South needed the gold that was in the banking system to buy the things from Europe that it needed. But at the onset of the war, many people rushed to the banks to try to get the gold out uh, to redeem their their deposits for gold because nobody knew what secession would actually mean. Uh, so the South needed to stop. The Southern government needed to stop that from happening. And the way that they did that was they essentially allowed all of the banks in, in contradiction to the law to suspend specie resumption, which is another way of saying the banks were allowed to not basically give their customers gold when their customers showed up to get it. Which just as a matter of history for people watching the banking at this time period, your deposits were supposed to always be redeemable actually in gold. That right? is correct. So the deposits were denominated in gold. The bank notes were deposited in gold. And it was supposed to be that if you showed up and said, here's my $5 note that entitles me to $5 worth of gold, the bank had to honor that. And if the bank didn't honor it, it was immediately placed in receivership, that is liquidated by the government. It was against the law, basically, for banks not to redeem. So the state legislatures began authorizing all of the banks, even the healthy ones, to, uh, to basically not... Uh, redeem their gold. And then the, the, the follow on part of that was that the South then started printing its own money and it required the banks to accept the newly issued Confederate currency on deposit. And if the banks refused to do so, the state legislatures threatened them by reinstating the old laws that would essentially make those banks go bankrupt for having suspended specie payments in the first place. So the banks, while nominally privately owned, actually become a, a tool of state war finance planning. Essentially. Ex exactly right. So they're essentially under duress. If you don't do what the state governments and the Confederate government have asked you to do, we will simply turn the law back on, basically, and your bank will go out of business. So 
either uh, do what we say or or else. So then what happens with the resorting to printing of notes? Now they have a banking system that they can push these out to. So what happens to price levels and coordination in the Confederate economy? Sure. So uh, over the course of the war, the Confederate money supply increases by about 780 uh, percent. And that ends up leading to uh, over 5000 percent inflation over the course of the war, which is about 10 uh, percent per month. Uh, as, as many of you, I'm sure you can probably imagine, when you have that sort of inflation going on, that makes economic coordination very difficult. It makes it very difficult for entrepreneurs to, say, start new industries to produce those things that the southern government might need. So even if, even if the southern government was open to the idea of entrepreneurship, the price signals that entrepreneurs would need to do that effectively are being completely distorted by the South's reliance on the printing press to, printing press to pay for the war. I mean, 10% a month, we're used to what, 2% a year, a little less than 2% a year that we're experiencing recently here. How does it compare to the North at the time, though? Because you mentioned the greenbacks were also inflationary. Yes. So the, the North also experienced a great deal of inflation, especially early on. But the North was able to transition away from printing money to other means of financing, which put a, put a reduced how quickly prices were rising. They still went up. But the South, I, I don't know the actual numbers off the top of my head, but I think it was probably over double the inflation rate uh, between the two. And the South had something else going on with it, too, because the currency was supposedly going to be redeemable in gold later, right? That is correct. So if you actually go uh, do a Google search for Confederate currency and you read the front of it, what you'll read is that it says essentially the following, the, the Confederate States of America will pay the bearer uh, in gold on demand six months after a peace treaty with the United States. Now, as the war progressed, it went from being six months to one year to two years. But the point is, is that the credibility of that promise Determine the partially determine the value of those notes, and as the the prospects for Southern victory diminished, that promise got worse and worse, and so the value of those notes uh, continued to fall, which only exasperated the inflation. Right. So you know uh, you're describing a lot of things internal to the Confederate economy that would be causing discoordination. So, uh, but at the same time, the, the Union had an economic strategy of blockading them so that they they couldn't get stuff. What effects were the blockade having relative to these other things? So that's an interesting story. So as soon as as soon as the South secedes, Lincoln implements what's called an anaconda, the Anaconda Plan, which was basically a snake of 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 Union ships that that started in Virginia and went all the way around to the Gulf of Mexico. And the idea here was a to prevent the South from exporting cotton to Europe, which it could then use to get the money it needs to buy goods. But then, of course, is also uh, to prevent the South from getting those goods that it actually needed. Now, one of the kind of funky things that happens here is that because of this embargo, it doesn't really pay European uh, merchants to bring in the kind of bare necessities that people in the South need, right? Instead, they start importing things like chocolate and lace and other types of luxury goods that many of the people who were really struggling in the South didn't need, right? They couldn't get the most basic. Or that the military didn't need. Or that the military didn't need. Exactly, exactly. And so what ends up happening is that this problem gets so bad that by the uh, 1864, the Southern legislature actually passes a law that says if ships are going to come into Southern uh, ports from Europe, that at least 80 or I think 80 or 85 percent of their hulls have to be dedicated to uh, necessities as defined, of course, by the Confederate legislature. So just back up here and just tell us the econ that's going on here, because it's not just random that they're choosing to send luxuries in. There's got to be an economic reason of why would the European shippers not send the stuff that the Confederates need in the war effort, but they send luxuries? Sure. So the 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 economics behind that is essentially it's a, rel a shift in relative prices. So what's happening is that there's some probability that if you try to run the Union blockade, the Union is going to capture your ship and take everything take everything off of there. And that that is true whether you're shipping luxury goods to the Confederacy or whether you're shipping bare necessities to the Confederacy. And so if you add on this this probability that there's going to be this cost uh, to you as the merchant, and you then look at how that cost affects the relative price, it actually lowers the relative price of luxury goods. And that's why European merchants were shipping, shipping luxury goods instead of necessities into the Confederacy. For any given volume, you need the highest valued stuff in there because to, to offset the risk. Yeah. Similar to what you see in the drug trade now with mm -hmm. high potency drugs crossing borders in, in dense packages. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you're going to transport drugs, the law doesn't make a distinction between whether it's potent or not potent. Right. So all is equal, 
you make the drug more potent. So last few seconds here then, just uh, looking at it as a whole of the interventions in their economy, were they doing the best they could to manage the war under tough situations or were they actively screwing up the war or screwing up their economy in a way that undermine their war efforts. So I think in many in many ways they they were basically screwing up their economies in, in a way that undermined the war effort. I think that at the beginning of our conversation you brought up this idea of entrepreneurs by not relying on on entrepreneurship and, and private enterprise uh, instead and instead relying on state-owned enterprises, uh, what ended up happening was that their economy was essentially com- was not coordinated at all. It was complete uh, discoordination. Uh, and then you you add on top of that that they're relying on the printing press to fund the war, which further distorts the price signals. And essentially, the the South's economy was no was never capable of supporting uh, a, a, an extended conflict with the Union. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today and talking about this, Brian. Thanks for having me here. Well, a little dive into history here today actually took a turn that allowed us to in some extent, examined capitalism and socialism. Uh, Our first guest talked about how slavery wasn't essential to the rise of capitalism and prosperity in the United States in the early half of the 19th century. And then when we talked about the economy of the Confederacy, we learned how it might be actually the episode in U.S. history where we came closest to some form of a socialist economy here in the United States, and it wreaked havoc there and maybe undermined their ability to fight the war. These are lessons that still probably have relevance today. We'll see you next time.